Welcome, welcome, welcome to the SubHub Podcast. I'm MK Sullivan. And I'm Danny Moreno. And today we are going to have a preview of the Golden Trail first World Series race. Yes, it is already beginning in April. This is going to be a fun year, so buckle in. Um, But this first race is Kobe Trail, so we're going to do an in-depth preview of it. And then MK is going to help finish it off with a preview for Kenyon's 50K and 25K if we can find some entrance for that race. Yeah, no promises, uh, because I will be recording this at a later time. Um, So yeah, hopefully we can get the 25k as well. And before we get into our in-depth preview of the Kobe Trail race that is happening this weekend, uh, we actually had a chance to chat with Francesco Poopy while we were doing his interview to kind of just listen in on some of his thoughts of the race since he is such a frequent Golden Trail World Series racer. Yeah, so enjoy our little chat with Francesco, and then we'll dive into the rest of the race. Since we have the Golden Trail World Series opening up their first two races, uh, we just wanted to ask you a couple questions about the races and the competition and get your point of view. Sure. Yeah. So first up is uh, Kobe Japan, and then second off, they have um, Four Sisters China. Those are the two races. What do you think about including two Asian races at the beginning of the season? Because this is earlier than the Golden Trail has ever started. Yeah, so I think uh, one of the goals of the Golden Trail World Series uh, has always been to truly be international and expand on pretty much every continent. (laughs) So it makes sense that they're landing in Asia for the first time and also expanding their calendar from six to eight races within a season. Um, It'll definitely be interesting to see how the athletes will do at those two races because, as you mentioned, they're per yearly in the season uh, and a lot of athletes are coming from their schema season or like from... uh, a winter of mostly like cross country and road running. So for a lot of them, it will be like their first real trail race of the year. Um, and I feel like when it's like that, like everyone is kind of like, maybe not, maybe not in their best shape. Like some of it may even be in their best shape, but you're like always trying to be, um, always trying to see what the others are doing and like not really knowing, um, exactly how fit you are um so i think those races will be very unpredictable also given that i think there's the race in china is like super high in altitude um and both of those races will be on a what i can imagine a pretty different terrain that what most people are used to uh i also hope that some good Asian athletes will show up because there is definitely an untapped potential in trail running in Asia, uh, China, Japan, uh, and all that area that we don't really know much about. But um, I think if you do like some research, you can find that there is a pretty big trail running scene over in China and Japan. Um, we don't know many of these athletes except from a few names that tend to race like the major international races or European and American circuits. So it'll be interesting how those athletes will um will do compared to the name the names that we usually see in the Golden Trail series. Yeah. And like we've mentioned before, a couple of times on the pod, Golden Trail will help you financially get to the next races if you finish in the top 10. So it would be so cool to see some like local crushers just show up, kind of upset some people and then get to continue in the series. Um, Like, you know, maybe go to Mont Blanc Marathon, maybe go to Sears and all like that would be so cool. Yeah, totally. Maybe someone, you know, from Nepal, uh, who is like living at 5,000 meters, uh, like like crushes it uh, at the race in Tibet in China. Um, And then, yeah, we'll see them in the European or American races. That would be really cool. Yeah. 
And so Danny and I, I feel like we did this hot take like at the end of December when we were doing our wrap up, but um, we think, especially on the women's side, like there is not going to be a repeat winner all year in this series. And um, this, you know, these first two races just kind of show that uh, depth. We have Madalena Floria, Sophia Lockley, Grayson Murphy, Maud Mathis. Meow Yao is going to be in China, but not in Japan. Like, what do you think about that hot take? <laughs> not uh, overall winner, but stages, like, yeah. So, like Kobe. Someone may win, but then that woman yeah. won't win uh, China and then going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a big hot take. Um, I mean, hopefully not for whoever wins uh, the first race. Uh, but it can definitely happen. I mean, considering how deep the level of the competition is and how talented this, these people are. I think it can definitely happen. Uh, my guess is like the first race will show, um, like will reward whoever uh, is the fittest coming out of the winter season. Um, for example, we've seen Sophia Lockley performing really, really well on the cross country skiing uh, world circuit. Um, it could translate to a really good running fitness. It may not, we don't know, but there is a lot of, like races are always unpredictable, but it's even more true uh, at the first race of the year. So we'll see. Yeah, definitely. Um, so that first course is uh, Kobe. Honestly, it's hard to find the China course, um, but from what we all know, it's, a little bit not as technical but it's at very high altitude but kobe itself is kind of like the flower style that they're imitating from the final that worked really well uh personally that's really exciting as like a viewer and so basically the runners are starting at a high point and i've never seen a course like this but they're basically bombing down each loop and then coming up and you're bombing down going up and from what i've heard it's a very technical course so you're bombing down technical uphills coming back up. Sounds brutal, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I know that that would be a tough course for me coming out of winter because I, I can't run downhill like that, like super steep downhills, um, especially where your mind is having to, you know, figure out the terrain at the same time. And we've got some heavy hitters on this course, like MK mentioned, Madalena, Sophia, Grace, and Maud Meow. Uh, oh, well, Meow's only China. And then we have Roberto, El Hussein, Bart, and Rui. In your opinion, uh, what type of athletes are going to succeed on Kobe maybe versus the China race? Yeah. Uh, so like the China race will definitely reward whoever can adapt the quickest to the altitude or whoever performs, performs best in altitude, which, uh, as we mentioned, it's, it's very different from athlete to athlete. And... Uh, I think the the Kobe trail, uh, which is more technical, will definitely reward um, runners who like generally perform better on technical terrain, and um, also I think whoever like is already like very well conditioned for the hop hills and downhills on such technical terrain. As you mentioned, like in the early stage of the season for for me and as I can imagine for many, many athletes, um, the ability to handle a lot of elevation is not as developed as maybe in late summer. Um, so I think we'll see a fair amount of people blowing up or like maybe experiencing like problems or cramps or like maybe st starting um, very fast or like in a really good position, but then not holding up until the end just because um, yeah, it's an early race and uh, it's, it's challenging. It's technical. Uh, it's unpredictable. So we'll see. 
Yeah, I think it'll be interesting because like, you know, Sophia and Grayson, like Sophia has been doing skiing, so she's probably not running bombing down hills right now. Uh, Grayson lives in the mountains, so she's probably trying her best, but like it's definitely snowy in Utah. But then you have like Madalena and Maud, who Maud just raced Chianti, which I imagine had a decent amount of descent. So at least she's practicing. And I know that like Madalena was at, in Madeira at some point, which doesn't have snow and you can like practice that kind of stuff. So it'll, I didn't realize that it was downhill out first. That definitely That's makes crazy. it way more interesting. <laughs> yeah. I would hate that. <laughs> Me too. I would hate that too. <laughs> like all just fighting and it looks like it potentially has like single tracks you're just fighting down technical single track i'd be in last place coming off of that first downhill <laughs> <laughs> but again like francesco said like not everyone has that repeatability in those downhill stabilizers musculature yeah. etc potentially this early in the season um but Roberto just came off a strong sky running win. Um, so that's someone who has been able to run technical downhill. Uh, Rui lives, he's from Japan. he doesn't have to travel across the world this time. And he's insane at technical downhills. Mm -hmm. um, so I still think there's going to be a lot of excitement. And, you know, last kind of caveat too, is these races are short-ish, you know? So yes. even if someone doesn't have the endurance stamina, they only need to last like, potentially two hours uh, two out hours. there yeah yeah just eat a ton of food and yeah you can potentially get away with not having the endurance right now yeah um yeah. it should be interesting let's talk kobe kobe trail is happening on april 20th and like danny said it's the first race in the series and it is looking to be super stacked already like i was a little bit surprised when Golden Trail basically moved the season up by adding these two races in Asia, but the athletes are not surprised and they are coming. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think it gives athletes a little bit more opportunity to maybe stretch their season in a different way or make it more not all at once because the season has historically always started in May and you kind of feel like you're semi going nonstop all the way to October. And so at least what we've noticed with the entries for all the races is it does seem like multiple athletes are picking, you know, two races to focus on, taking a break, and then coming back later in the season, or vice versa, like they're looking at all the races kind of in the center of the calendar. So yeah, yeah. I think it adds a little bit more. What do you, what, how do you say that? Like pizzazz? <laughs> <laughs> Like, uh, yeah, uh, opportunities to yeah. to race, yeah. Especially but, because, like, three of the opportunities are, like, back-to-back. -back. Like, this one in Kobe and China. And then you have Sears and all in Portugal, which I don't know are back-to-back -back weekends, but they're pretty close. And then the two American races are back-to-back -back weekends. So you can make one trip, two races, instead of having to, like, travel multiple times, which is easier for most people in general, but also easier if you're an unsponsored athlete. Yeah, definitely. And it's Poland, not Portugal. <laughs> oh, did I say Portugal? <laughs> yeah. Poland. Poland. Two, two very two different countries. <laughs> <laughs> Similar starts, but still different. Um, so yeah, this first race, like MK Saint said, it's uh, really delivering. And we did some big detective work for y'all. So we hope you appreciate this because we were so curious about this race because there's like no intel on it ever. I think it's a new race potentially. Like there's no past results, etc. Um, the first thing that we noticed looking at, do you want to talk about the course first? Probably the course first. And yeah, then we'll talk about the course. The entries. Um, is there are two starts. There's a women's start and there's a men's start. The women start at 1305, so 105 for us Americans. Um and then the men start at 13.35, so 1.35, so 30-minute difference. I do think the front men are going to catch the women, even though the women are crazy strong. Um, because this race, y'all, has, we think, <laughs> um, about 7,000 feet of gain. We plugged the GPX into all trails. And so on all trails, it said 21.3K with... 2000 meters basically so 13.2 miles and 6700 feet yeah and then we found some segments on strava 
Uh, they're, they've already made segments for the, the separate loops, but also the entire course. And a couple of Japanese athletes who are racing have run the full course. And it's saying 14.77 miles with 7,629 feet of vert. So that's a thousand more feet and In only one mile. a mile and a half. Yeah. <laughs> that's wild. Oh. And then finally, or those are the only two that we had. Uh, yeah, all trails yeah. on Strava. Yeah. And then, oh, and then the GPX. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, the website. The website says 13.2 miles. Yeah. So it's just, it's a wild difference in here. Oh, yeah. The GPX. Gonna... Oh, sorry. I messed The GPX said 12.7 miles, 5,700 feet of gain. And the website said 13.2 miles with 6,700 feet of gain. And then Strava is just popping off and saying like over 14 miles with well over 7,000 feet of gain. Yeah, which I'm a big GPX person. Like when they share the GPX, that's oh. what I base so much on my training based off of. Same. And if I rolled up thinking there was 5,700 feet and then you almost run 2,000 feet more. And we did check multiple Stravas. This isn't just yeah. from one Strava profile. Like pretty much all of them were over 14 miles and over 7,000 feet. Yeah. And like Danny was saying, so there's the staggered start, which we just saw this weekend at Calamoro Sky Race, or I guess this will be two weekends ago. And um, they, the men started 30 minutes after. The women finished the race in like three hours. Roberto finished it in 225. He ended up passing them with a little bit of time to go. The The fastest time that we have seen, and granted, these are people doing like easy runs, runs yeah. this course is three and a half hours. So the men are definitely going to pass the women if it's like the men are running three hours plus. Yeah. But <laughs> that could get wild. Yeah. And it gets wilder, folks. Like <laughs> wild in the sense that this is a very, it's a hard course, yes. right? Um, The course is made up of four loops and the loops, like the hardest loops are pretty much the third and fourth loop so as the race goes on the loops get harder and harder and there's this key transition between the third and the fourth loop oh no the second and the third loop where the athletes will actually be able to see each other as they're heading into the hardest part of the course so that's very exciting as a spectator but also if you're like an athlete running that can be pretty mental um seeing your competitors either like right there or right behind you yeah. So these loops, <laughs> loop one is 3.7 K and 295 meters, which is 967 feet. Loop two is 6.1 K with 516 meters or 17,000 feet of gain. Loop three is a 10 K or a 6.2 K with 671 meters, which is 2,200 feet of gain. <laughs> and loop four is 5.3 K with 2,000 feet a game. So like Danny said, it gets harder every lap because you go 960 feet, seven feet a game, 1,700 feet a game, 2,200 feet a game, 2,000 feet a game. <laughs> yeah. And you're and descending that, the same amount that you are gaining because each loop you go down and then back up. To the same start point. Yeah. yeah. And the wildest part of this course, I mean, it's all pretty wild. We saw some YouTube videos as well. And for the athletes that are running it, be prepared. This course is very technical, um, but miles like 10 through 13 look particularly tough because you lose a thousand feet and then you gain a thousand feet roughly within a mile and a half. Then you lose another thousand feet in a mile. Sorry, these are per miles. And mile 13, when you're on the last part of this race, you gain another thousand feet before <laughs> finishing like the last mile you gained 272 feet. But I can only imagine like you're just surviving at that yeah. point. Like if you can run after four miles of basically losing and gaining 2000 feet, it's just whole oh, next level. Yeah. And looking at the Strava profile that we kind of used um, for, for just like the trail by Kakeru Oka, um, and I'm sure he was doing an easy run, but like, regardless the paces that he's running on these uphills as a man are slow enough to tell me that they're not super runnable, like 18, yeah. 21 pace, 23, 12 pace, 18, 14, like 
usually if you can run up a hill, especially for a guy, like you're maybe doing like 10 to 13 minute pace. But once you start getting into that, like 18 to 25 minute miles, it's looking less runnable to me. Yeah. yeah. It's looking a little rough, especially because he started his run, like at pretty normal, like paces for a guy yeah. just like out on a run, like his gap started at 627 623 and then it just gets slower and slower yeah <laughs> and that's on. probably what's going to happen in this race like i don't see anybody like negative splitting the first half and the second half of this race there's way too much like descending and gaining yeah yeah it's just it'll yeah. be fun i'm so excited for all of you guys yeah it's gonna be super fun to definitely spectate i feel like loop one is just gonna be a bloodbath Living. because you have three you basically have a 3K or almost 4K. So what is that? Like two and a half miles or so to yeah. get out before you head into like this madness of down, up, down, up, down, up. And this race is so different because most of the time when you have these type of races, you start on a climb and then you're descending and you go up, down, up, down. Whereas this race, you finish on a smashing uphill. Um, so it's kind of something like if you haven't done it before, I'm just... I just have a lot of question marks now for athletes that I would normally like put all my money on. Um, yeah. I mean, be in, super interesting. in the first descent alone, which is what you start on, it's 1.1 miles and you lose 800 feet. Like that's no joke. It look, yeah. It looks so small compared to that. Yeah. It's, I mean, at points, it's a 22% grade that you're running down 32%, like oh 36%. This is crazy. And that's Dude. the beginning you have to have quads. Like you have to have yeah. quads for this race. Like you could be the, one of the best climbers in the world, but if your stabilizers and quads aren't ready coming out of potentially winter for some of these folks, you're going to feel it hard. Yeah. Um, and we didn't, we didn't even say one of the best final aspects of this whole thing. It's like a bow on top. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. So as we mentioned, the start times, if you noticed are in the afternoon, 1 PM. Heat of the what day. tends to happen <laughs> it gets hot and the humidity of this race it looks roughly like based on the weather like the past few weeks and looking forward can roughly be between like 70 and 90 percent yeah and the, and the, the 70, high is 70 degrees so like fahrenheit fahrenheit yeah, yeah. fahrenheit that's warm especially <laughs> with the humidity and especially for most athletes except for those that are living in japan currently like yeah we're in winter over here in in north america so i mean and even in europe <laughs> yeah 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 70 it's, degrees is is pretty hot yeah i feel like i'm frothing we're both frothing about this race because this is just an insane race already just looking at it like this yeah Damn. we should include this uh this strava file in our yeah. show notes so that people can because I'm just like running over the grades like with my mouse right now and like the downhills are so so steep yeah the, if, like when do you see 40 percent in a race yeah there's a lot of it in this one <laughs> there's so much 40 percent oh dang I, I, oh. I've seen 47 in a couple of times yeah like most of the time if you see above 30 percent it's on one part but it's literally these two last downhills both have between 30 and 40 percent like for quite a bit wow i can't wait for right. live stream <laughs> yeah um so we set you up that's the course that's the race we should get into the main contenders because this race There's is kind a of lot insane. of them um we will caveat or, or it's more just like a fact and something we should point out is this is the first of two races. There's Japan and China. And the fields are looking super international, but it has come to our attention that visas for the China race are gonna are particularly difficult for some countries, just like it is for North America for some, you know, some athletes that have been left out of the North American races. Um, it is the reality of the world today. And so um there, I have. There's a good chance that while some of these athletes are on this race, they won't be racing in China. And so, if I know I'm only running running one race versus two, I'm just going to go all out a bit more um, versus like potentially 
what do you call that? Like balancing the energy between the two. I don't yeah. Know. I mean, cause it is hard to do a double, like a back-to-back -back weekend. Like yeah. yeah, you want to go like give your all, but in some senses you also kind of have to be prepared to do it again. So you don't want to go over the edge, I think maybe. Exactly. And so yeah. like one of the countries that needs a visa for China is North or America. Um, so with heavy hitters like Sophia Lockley, Grace and Murphy, uh, et cetera, this might be their only race, even though they're signed up for China as well. So maybe if you're a French or Spanish athlete, like you get the points you need at Japan and then can serve for potentially a higher place in China. Just yeah, yeah, because we did look it up and it's fairly easy to get a visa if you are in like most of Europe. Yeah. French, China. France, Spain. Germany, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, and Malaysia all yeah. like can pretty easily get a Chinese uh, visa. Cool. All right. Now that we've pointed that out, y'all get into it. Yeah. This women's race. <laughs> finally, finally, anyone who is a trail fan, finally, we are getting the three heavy hitter American women lineup. Yeah. Tell the folks I'm okay. <laughs> Sophia Lockley, overall winner last year, one Sears and all, like one Pikes Peak, one at all. One at all. Murphy was kind of hurt last year, but still world champion in the classic, second place in the vertical to none other than Andrea Marr. Allie Mack, world champion in 2023, also a heavy hitter in the Golden Trail World Series that year. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? And Grayson was returning champ. Like she owns the world mountain classic right now, like yeah. back to back champ, um, which is up, down, up, down kind of stuff. Yeah. And like these ladies, we could say so much more about their resume. Those are just like a couple of the highlights. highlights. <laughs> wow. Okay. So that's just the Americans. Uh, so if you're an American trail running fan or world fan, that alone is a race, but you add in Sarah Alonzo recently, uh, course record at Calamaro. Uh, Julia battled it out with Sarah Alonso. Julia Font, uh, both Spanish runners, coming in hot after what we think is the perfect race setup for this race. Couldn't have picked a more perfect race. You have yeah. Malin Osa, who was fourth overall last year in her rookie season. Uh, you have Joyce Nagiru. Uh, hopefully she can get over there as well. Um, Maud Mathis. <laughs> the, list the return of mod the return of mod uh the last time we saw her might have been second at zagama a couple of years ago behind ninke where she also went out of the course record i can't remember she if ran she... sears and all that year too and uh oh, oh yeah did she yeah she was second to the woman who ended up getting caught for doping oh crazy so she ended okay. up yep. winning yeah she ended up winning still sylvia nordic star um the Scandinavian, she was six overall last year. Teresa LaBeouf, recently top three at Chianti. Alice Gaggi, top 10. Uh, I think it's Gaggi. At uh, Sears and Al, the Italian runner. And then Danielle uh, Wemus, one Zagama. Oh, that was a mouthful. If if all of those people show up, because we'll also preface the fact that we don't have a final top 10, but these are the people that we know and have seen. We're planning yeah. on it earlier. But if all of these women show up, like it's going to be hard to pick a top five seven eight <laughs> like i don't know yeah. like yeah it's, it's, it's tough people are people are definitely i think the the asia races offer athletes an opportunity to get golden trail world series points early and then not have to worry about them as much later in the year so then they can run other series so like it makes sense that people are here yeah and this doesn't even include like undiscovered japanese athletes who yeah could very well just like come and smash it and win the whole thing and it wouldn't be surprising sort not of thing. at all yeah <laughs> um let's kind of pick apart so it's hard to pick a top five so we're gonna but we're gonna try and narrow down on top like five women who we think are in especially good place right now maybe six Sophia all right smashed last year she has proven she could run anything like even yeah. Dolomites like she got beat by judith but not by much and judith is one of the best downhillers in the world if not the best downhiller um, and she did really well at norway the year before did she win norway she won norway she won yeah. norway which was an insanely technical course yes she from what i remember blasted the climb and yes. then survived 
but like yeah. that just shows her climbing prowess. Yeah. Um, she's coming off a ski season, but she was just in Corsica with the Solomon running camp. And just based off the snippets, it looks like she was chasing down the guys in the VK. So I'd have to imagine she is in fine climbing shape. Um, the only asterisk is these technical downhills, but like having had a very uh, terrible stint in cross-country skiing, learning how to do it, it does work your quads. And she podiumed and, and won her first World Cup race this past year. So I have to imagine she's strong enough. It's more of just like the neurological patterns and her willingness to throw herself down the mountains. Yeah. And like, maybe she's been throwing herself down the mountains in Oslo the last couple, I mean, the yeah. mountains in Oslo, but like the hills of Oslo. Um, because yeah, I think that'll be Sophia's biggest downfall in this whole race is just like, does she have the quads to survive the second half? Yeah. But like, as we know, she can climb, she, but she, yeah, she is strong though. Like she like is for sure been doing the weight room with skiing season and stuff like that. Um, it's more of just like the racing pounding is slightly like it's, you will never be able to replicate it just right if you haven't been running steep downhills. Yeah. Um, but damn, if her Grayson and Allie are at the bottom of that last hill together before the final, who do you even bet on? I don't you know can't. because they're all just like world the class best. climbers. Yeah. yeah. That's like wild. Sophia hasn't been to a world championship, but she won Sears and all, which is a double VK into a half marathon. And she was like in second, I think, at the top of the climb. So it's like, yeah. Yeah. It's, it'll be so interesting because Grayson and Allie have been running all winter. Um, but they're also in winter. So yeah. you can only get so high. You can do a lot of like uphill work on treadmills or like on the dry trails that you can find. But like Danny said, it's really hard to replicate that downhill in the winter, but also like to find something that's steep pretty much anywhere in the U S other than like the top of the Wasatch or like the San Juans is like really, I, like, I don't even know where you would do that. <laughs> Maybe the Grand Canyon. Like if you went up and down, if you're in Arizona, yeah. But I don't even know if it's that steep because it's kind of. It's not like... that steep and it's not, it's just stairs. So like you'll get the pounding, but you won't get the practice of. 40%. Pounding with technical, like, yeah. And 40%, like, holy. Yeah. 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 Cause then, yeah, you move on to Grayson. This is her debut in the series. Ali and Sophia have both been to many of these races. Um, but Grayson's no stranger to like big events. She's been to the biggest world, uh, track events in the world, um, biggest, you know, world championships and stuff like that. So I think like the circus that we love to call it, I don't think that'll phase her much. Um, it is. Yeah. It's just kind of like that constant, like up, down pounding technical terrain. Um, because none, none of these athletes have raced in Japan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really. Yeah. So it's like, maybe it's a, it's a negative, but it's a negative for everyone. And Grayson's is healthy. That's yeah. like the biggest that's thing. Dangerous. Like, that's extremely dangerous. Like a healthy Grayson. And it looks like on Strava, she's been running more miles than she has in the past, which, which is extremely dangerous. For yeah. A Grayson on the start line for her, yeah, like for, sure. for her competitors. Yeah. Yeah. But then like on the other side, you have the two Spanish women, Sarah and Julia, who I think originally like you and I were like, oh yeah, they'll for sure be fighting for like a podium spot, like definitely. But, you know, even they said to us like, oh no, no, like we won't do it. But I, they ran Calamoro, which having looked at this course now is almost identical in terms of like the turn, like the terrain's probably different, but it was three big steep climbs and big descents. And it was run at 5 p.m., which was hot. And Sarah talked about her stomach like being all messed up, but now she knows how to practice for it, how to train for it. Like they literally just did the same thing two weeks prior and they crushed it. So I'm not counting them out, either of them out for like a top no. spot, a win. Definitely no. not the podium. Yeah. Oh, definitely not. I, I mean, they basically did, I don't know, unintentionally or intentionally, the most perfect race before this race that you could have done that yeah. was on the calendar anywhere in the world yeah. pretty much i mean the biggest uh, thing will just be like recovering 
yeah, recovering from that, which they still have plenty of time. They need to get over there. Um, and they know they can push. And then kind of the last person I wanted to highlight was Malin Osa, just because last year was her rookie year. Um, and so I just think she's going to get better and better. And she, even last year in her first year was crushing downhills. Yeah. Um, she's just a very athletic runner and can do all the movements and stuff like that. And she's and, a lot like Sarah where she will just throw herself down anything like exactly. no fear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing too, is like, we talk about going into the last climb, but if you have someone like Sarah going into that last downhill, she will, she, that woman is fearless. She will throw her body down that. And she, yeah, she will beat you to the bottom. <laughs> yes. Like but, she talks that she's not a good technical downhill runner, but she, she is. She is. She's very she's, good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But you have Sophia Grayson and Allie who potentially, we don't know what it is officially, but they are North American. If they can't get into China, they all want and kind of need this win to be competitive in the series or just like a high placing. So they might be willing to also push it a little bit more. Dang. Um, do you want to call your podium? Oof. I don't, I don't know. even know if it's possible. Yeah, I I think it's too early. Maybe we'll we'll save podiums for China because then we'll yeah. have an idea of where people are at. <laughs> totally. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if any of these women won. Yeah. Sort of thing. And that's my top six for sure, right there. Yeah. So Some combo of that. Sarah, Julia and Malin. <laughs> yeah. That's so but wild. who knows? Because again, there could be a Japanese woman that comes in and just like blows our mind. Exactly. Yep. I'm still sticking with my hot take that no race is going to have a repeat winner though. Yeah. Just knowing what's after Kobe and now knowing the, you know, reality that some of the North American women may not be able to race China. I don't think there's going to be a repeat winner and also recovering after this race to Gosh. race the following weekend. Imagine. Do you just like walk around? I would just lay and like watch shows and eat yeah. for like, two or three days and then you, you have to travel running yeah and you have to travel maybe yeah. like a sit on the stationary bike like so slow that your heart rate doesn't even get up but you're just like moving your legs yeah, <laughs> yeah. ouch <laughs> um oh the last thing I want to touch upon winning time so Sarah just ran basically Sarah and Julia just ran three hours for their race was slightly longer and less burnt Okay, so the winning time is probably going to be over three hours for women. Yeah, probably just over for women. We'll say like 3.15. Yeah. I mean, 3.20. Because the heat, like that heat. is a whole nother level. Humidity, because they ran in heat, but they didn't run in humidity, which is- It was humid, but level. not quite as humid, yeah. Not, oh, not as humid. Okay. But um, like those, just the tech, the steepness of the downhills alone will make them like not as fast, I think. Yeah, yeah. So- Oh, right. We'll just have to uh, wait and see. Should we jump into the men? Speaking of Calamora Sky Race and it yeah. being the perfect, um, yeah, yep, tune up for <laughs> Kobe. Roberto De Lorenzi is signed up for um, Kobe. He was sixth overall last year, and he just won Calamoro. And he also just ran sub twenty nine in a ten k, like right before that, which is disgusting. So, <laughs> like again, somebody that I'm like putting on my podium for sure now after that uh, Calamoro race. Yeah. And then no other than, I think this is such a great battle right here. El Hussein. Yeah. Um, he won the final races last year. He won Dolomites, which is the most technical race. And he kind of was a little bit of surprise for me at that race. Like I didn't have him winning. Um, and then he, <laughs> how do you even one up that 29? He ran under 28 in the same 10 K and, and it's like a rolling us that it was rolling yeah <laughs> i just think those two are gonna have a great battle like yeah. it's hard not to think they'll they um they'll be up there yeah because um i guess let's just we gotta read them all uh, yeah, yeah. Come back. Yeah. yeah um alex garcia carrillo he was 10th overall last year um sam hendry is on the list but we're not sure if he's racing um, but if he is, he's very good at technical downhills. So, like, I wouldn't be surprised if he did well at this event. Patrick Kipmieno and Philemon Ombogo um, from Kenya. Second at Sears and all for Patrick and second overall last year. First at Sears and all for Philemon, but third overall in the series last year. 
Anders, who I don't know personally, but I have heard you talk about many times saying that he's like hands down one of the best downhillers in the world. Yep. So if he's there, that really makes things spicy. Um, Petro Mamu, who, yeah, you know. He was known caught previously. Past doper, yeah, known previous doper. So like, we'll just skim over that. Daniel Pattis was ninth overall last year. Um, Bart is coming back which is not surprising, seventh overall last year. An exciting addition back into the Golden Trail World Series is Rui Ueda, who is Japanese. Um, he got in a really, really scary bike accident last year after the World Championships and was basically out for the rest of the year. Um, but my guess is that he, oh, no, we saw. He has run part of, at least part of the course, if not all of it. Yeah. Um, and he's super good at technical downhills. So, like, yeah. I'm excited to see his come back to the golden trail yep and then the last two we have andy wacker again not sure if he is racing um and then we have ruta iwa uh, who was recently second at the oshi shinshiro 64k which is a race in japan yeah um but yeah this men's race it's the see it um, it's sorry. less of a it's less of a toss-up for me yeah it is for me as well i would say roberto and el hussein and probably have, Rui. Are, and really are just like podium picks yeah patrick and philemon i think are still gonna do well i just haven't seen them on this sort of technical terrain whereas roberto el hussein and really are like tried and true like they crushed this yeah. and like really having hometown advantage uh or home country advantage i mean he doesn't have to travel also so i wouldn't be surprised if he just wins the whole thing too yeah. now being back yeah wild yeah that's uh i think but, that's pretty much my like those those three i don't know who it's gonna be but yeah. i think those three are probably my top three yeah the only thing though is el hussein he was supposed to run shianti after that 10k and he didn't so hopefully he's healthy yeah uh, hopefully he just skipped thing. out because he was like I gotta that's too much that's yeah yeah <laughs> exactly yeah because i mean he, El, El showed up to the final last year after having only done dolomiths and absolutely wrecked people in the final yeah. Yeah. like he didn't just like kind of win like he like super won <laughs> yeah, he's super won. <laughs> just like yeah. just like madalena on the women's side like yeah, yeah. exactly oh dang so um i'm excited me too anything else on kobe I don't think so. Um, I don't think so either. We're going to come out with a, another episode for the race in China, the Four Sisters race. Um, we thought about doing it all at one time, but we'd really like to see like the results of this race uh, before we talk about the next one. So we'll save that for next week. Um, and now for a message from our sponsor before I dive into Canyon's preview. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Never Second. Never Second uses a modular system that allows you to create the exact carbohydrate formula for your need and activity. Their products are meant to be mixed and matched so that you can have 30, 60, 90, or even 120 grams of carbs per hour. As a professional athlete, I was introduced to Never Second about a year ago after a rough race at the Mont Blanc Marathon. I was trying to take in gels that required a lot of water, but without a crew and the fact that there weren't enough aid stations to adequately match my intake, it became quite the struggle of a day. After that experience, I started using Never Second in training because their liquid gels weren't as sticky and require less water and are much easier to get down, making my race day and training nutrition immediately more successful and simple. And if you want to try Never Second, just head to neversecond.com. N E V E R number two dot com and use code subhub25 for a 25% discount on all of your orders. So, Canyons 50K is the next uh, American UTMB race that we have coming up. Uh, it will be happening in Auburn, California, on many of the trails that Western States occurs on. Um, it is also a major which means that instead of the normal top three qualifying out of each race for um, the UTMB events the following year, uh, it will be top 10. So for uh, the race that I'm going to be covering, which is just the 50K today, 
Um, the people who finish in the top 10 will have automatic entry into the 2025 version of OCC. Um, they can also apply to race CCC instead of OCC, which is the 100K distance, um, but that isn't guaranteed to be approved. So, but they do have a spot at OCC for 2025. Um, and this race is looking to be pretty spicy. So um, I just want to preface by saying that the running, as of the time that I'm recording this, the uh, runner's list has not been uploaded onto the Canyon's website. So what I'm going off of is the elite runners um, page. And as we all know, like that very well could be missing someone because uh, specifically for UTMB, the elite requirements um, to get, you know, onto that list is basically uh, for women, 650 points, men, 800. But in that case, you would have to pay to run the race um, to not pay to run the race and to get elite status. Uh, women need a 710 and men an 850. So again, we could be missing somebody. Um, like for example, Molly Seidel is supposed to be running this race, but like she doesn't have a 50K index. So she is not included on this elite list. Um, so let's start with the course. Um, I actually ran this 50K last year and I thought that it was going to be the same exact course, but because the 100K is now coming down from China Wall instead of doing loops, um, the 50K has actually changed direction from last year so that there's no um, opposite direction running for the 100K and 50K athletes. They will be running in the same direction on the trail. So um, the 50K starts and finishes in downtown Auburn. You start off on the road pretty hot and you immediately like descend down to the river. You cross, um, I think you cross no hands bridge at this point, but you descend down to the river and then you immediately begin your first climb. And the first climb you gain around 1500 feet in like three ish miles. The next 24 K, um, you are kind of rolling up on this beautiful ridge. It can be very hot, can be very exposed, but it, the views are like unbeatable. Um, and so you're, you're rolling along for quite some time before a pretty dramatic drop back down to the river, um, down to Mammoth Bar, which is at 37K, straight back into a super steep but short uphill, like probably less than a mile, but you gain like 800 to 900 feet in that mile. And then you have another gradual descent back to the river, cross over No Hands Bridge, and you finish the last three to four miles on the slight uphill back to Auburn. Um, but as anyone who has run formidable or canyons knows that slight uphill does get steeper, the further and further you get up it. Um, especially once you get to Roby point and you have to finish the climb up the road, that is like Mount Everest at that point. And then it's a pretty substantial downhill into town, um, and to the finish. So I think, Last year, Heather Jackson ran this in 4.07. Um, I do think that it will be run a little bit faster this year on the women's side, at least. Um, I think the women will be somewhere around four hours. And I think that Hayden Hawks ran around 3.20 last year, which is part of why I think that the women's race could go faster. Um, that's quite a substantial gap between the two times. So um, a big thing to note, though, difference this year versus last year. Last year, the 50K had the option to have crew bring them things at uh, the halfway point, so at 25K. But this year, there will be no crew. So if it's a hot day, that might be a little bit rough. Definitely doable. You know, four hours is just short enough. I hate even calling it short because that's not short. But just short enough that you can definitely carry all the calories that you need. But it just does get a little, like clunky. So it's always nice to have crew, but they will not have crew allowed this year. The race starts at 6 a.m., um, which is nice because the 50K will probably finish before it starts to get too hot if it's a hot day. Um, there's supposed to be a live stream, but last year they had a lot of internet issues. So I would not be surprised if the live stream doesn't work out for some reason, but maybe they worked out the kinks from last year. Um, if there is a live stream, it will be on the UTMB live website, so it'll be fairly easy to find. So let's talk about our women's field. 
Um, we have our very own Danny Moreno, um, who is leading off the women's elite field here. Danny ran a 110 half marathon in February in Ventura. Um, she was third at the Mont Blanc Marathon and OCC in 2022, second at Mammoth Trail Fest last year in 2023, and first at the Kodiak uh, 53K, which is how she qualified for this year's OCC. Um, right behind her is Jen Lichter. Jen won recently won the Transvolcania Marathon quite handily. She was fourth at the Short Trail in Austria um, back for the World Championships. And she also won JFK 50 miler last year. Um, Juliette Soule, she recently won the Noosa Ultra Trail 50K and was seventh at the UT Australia 50K. So making a trek over to the US to try to get a spot for OCC, pretty cool. Tabor Hemming uh, ran 113 and a half in February in Phoenix. She won the Big Alta 21K and was second at Desert Rats Half Marathon just this last weekend. So I'm sure that was a nice little tune-up for her prior to the 50K. Sam Lewis is a multiple-time Team USA member and was recently second at the Gorge 30K. Um, like I said, Molly, Se Molly Seidel is also slated to run this race. This would be her first 50K trail race, I believe. Um, so we'll be interesting to see how that goes for her. Um, on the men's side, it seems like it's like a states, Western States tune up for half of them and an OCC qualifier for the other half of them. Um, and so I think this is going to be a really exciting race. We've got Eli Hemming, who has proven himself to be one of the best, uh, you know, sub to mid ultra uh, runners in the country in the last year or two. He recently won Black Canyon 60K in a course record time, won the Big Alta 50K by almost 20 minutes, and he won the Desert Rats Half Marathon uh, for a nice tune up last weekend. Chad Hall, um, actually, the last time that he and Eli raced, he actually beat Eli at the Kodiak 50K back in. 2023. Um, Chad also qualified for the Olympic trials marathon, but had to pull out due to an injury. I am not 100% sure if he's recovered from that injury, but my guess is that he is um, because a lot of people who are injured have taken themselves off of these lists at this point. Seth ruling. So this one is really uh, kind of exciting and interesting. We've got Seth ruling and Peter Ferragno from Poland and uh, Seth was sixth at CCC. Peter was seventh at CCC last year. So this is kind of like a duel, a rematch for them almost, if you might uh, call it that. Seth was also the winner of JFK this last fall. And he was second at the Chuck and Up 50K uh, two years ago, I believe. Peter Franjo was also third at the Long Trail Worlds in Austria. So he's kind of moving down in distance for this race. Um, curious to see if he's just trying to qualify for CCC with a shorter race, or if maybe he's trying to qualify for OCC to just run something different next year. Um, we have Jeff Colt. So this is kind of our, these last three guys are our list of people doing a tune up for Western States. <laughs> Jeff Colt was eighth at the States last year. Um, and he was also third at the 2023 desert rats. His UTMB profile famously says, it's better to dance through life than race through it. Amen, Jeff. <laughs> uh, Danny Jones recently won Terraware 100K, and he was the returning champ, having won it the year before as well in 2023. Um, he is also returning to Western States this year, having finished fifth place last year. And then Cole Watson is um, coming down to the 50K. Last year, he won the 100K, securing his spot to Western States. And then he finished ninth at Western States. So he will also be returning to that. And I have imagine that this 50K is like a good tune up for him. Um, so yeah, those are our elite fields. I am hesitant to call a podium, but the race, the show must go on. This race is going to be so exciting. Um, the women's side for me is a little less difficult. I'm going to go um, first place, Danny Moreno, second place, Jen Lichter, third place, Tabor Hemming. And on the men's side, it's a little bit harder for me. Um, Eli and Chad are obviously like two of the best 50K athletes in the country. But 
depending on where Peter and um, Seth are in their training, I could also see them like being pretty big contenders. Um, obviously, a huge part of this, too, is if Chad is coming back from his injury or not. But it does seem like he has been running a decent amount of mileage, looking like he's preparing for this race. So I'm going to go... Oh, God, actually, this is really a lot harder than I thought it would be. So I can't choose between Eli and Chad. I'm going to go with a dark horse kind of here. I mean, not really a dark horse if you think about it, but I think that uh, Chad Hall wins. Eli Hemming is very close second. I think it's going to be a race to the wire for the two of them. And I think Seth Rowling's going to end up third. I think he and Peter will also be racing it out pretty hard, but I think that Seth is kind of having like a really big year um, ever since CCC last year. And I just see him continuing to roll. So yeah, um, tune into Canyons. Danny and I will both be there. As I just mentioned, um, she is running the 50 K. I will be running my debut 100 K um, goal is to get to the finish line this time around. But yeah, come uh, if you see us out there. Say hi, give us a cheer, and uh, we'll see you on the other side.